Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to the May edition of Union Community Hours. Uh, I hope uh, all of you are having a very good day. Uh, my name is Abid, and I will be helping today our usual host Julio, who has a small issue with his voice, which means he doesn't sound like he usually do. Uh, but don't be sad. We will still hear from him, and we will as we will proceed with the session. Um, Today uh, our agenda is not very full, so but we still have some news uh, yeah, for the very uh, first point. So we released Uni on 10th May, uh, uh, Uni 2022 05, and we will hear from Uni uh, from uh, Julio what we had in this session. Uh, and then he will briefly explain what we will be going to have uh, in Unit 2206. And then we will be presenting a very cool initiative that we will be working on. Uh, we had been working on for the last couple of months and that will be present uh, will be presented by John. And at the end of that uh, session, there will be, of course, space for questions if, uh, that you might have. And yeah, that will be it. So this is our agenda. And um, for the next couple of uh, slides, uh, Julio will take over. Yeah, very briefly, so I don't break my voice even even more. We release Uni 2022-05 from, if I recall correctly, May the 10th. Uh, here are the uh, new things for that release. The first two things, the reporting database documentation and Spacewalk report, now using data from the reporting database. Both things were presented already at the last Uni Community Hours session. So just watch the recording and all the information is there. What's, it was presented by Thomas. Then we added the capability of adding systems for, with failed actions to the system set manager, meaning that now if we have a list of, of, of systems that fail to execute something, you can add them to the system set manager and relaunch the action in one shot for all of them. All the details about how to use it uh, are at the release notes. And then finally for Unit 2022-05, the JSON over HTTP API was merged as technology preview and Jan will be presenting it later. <clears throat> now the next version will be Unit 2022-06. And uh, well, first a big, big warning we are going to have a change for the base operating system for both server and proxy, meaning that everyone will be uh, required to run the major upgrade procedure instead of the usual procedure you do with just stopping the services, calling zipper ref, zipper app, and starting the services again. The change for the operating system, the base operating system, will be from OpenSUSE LIB 15.3 that we are using since the last summer to the next iteration of OpenSUSE LIB, which is 15.4. With that, we'll come PostgreSQL 14. If you want to see <clears throat> the list of improvements for PostgreSQL 14, the release notes for this version are link, uh, will be linked at the release notes for Unit 2020.06 itself. In a similar fashion, we are also updating SALT to 3004. And there is a small trick here, because if you remember all the other community hours we have in the past, we told that we introduced the SALT bundle, meaning that the SALT bundle will be version 3004 for absolutely all the clients we support. Even if they are old, such as CentOS 7 and SLE 12, and they don't have Python 3, the bundle will still work there because we include Python and all the dependencies we require inside the bundle. However, for the regular package, if you are still using it, not the bundle, SLE 12 and CentOS 7 will remain using SALT 3000 because Python 3 is required and it's not available there by default. That said, usually you should not need it. And we encourage everyone to migrate to the SALT bundle as soon as possible. Remember that for systems that were onboarded before the bundle was available, the migration is not automated. You just need to use a SALT state to do the upgrade to the bundle. 
that is already part of the release notes for the time when we introduced it. If I recall correctly, it was 2022 or four when we added the bundle. And uh, yeah, well, I guess that someone will ask when we are going to release 2022-06. I cannot give you an exact date, but I can tell you that for sure, not before June 21st. Some day after that, I hope that in that very next week, we will be able to release 2022-06, of course. That also means that we need the 15.4 release as goal master, but should be done by that date. <clears throat> and that's it from me. You can make some questions now if you want, or otherwise we can do it and at the end as you prefer. So the migration to 22.06, will that be uh a two-step uh, thing where you do both the, the OS and do uni together, and then you also do a database migration. Is that right? Yes, that's right. It's the same we had the last summer. There will be a script that will help you with this thing, so you don't need to run a lot of steps manually. The script, the server migrator, will replace the repositories uh that we had for OpenSUSE Elite 15.3 with those for 15.4 we'll take care of changing the packages from uni to lib 15.4 as needed because now we are taking some more packages from there and then it will tell you to run the migration of the database that you will need to do calling the script for the migration migration database and then of course this will be on the release notes, but remember, this is important that you, you should always update the server first, and then the proxies. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Julio. Uh, I guess now we will proceed with uh, session from John. And then, of course, at the end of the session, there will be another opportunity to ask any question. Now, this this session will be about, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, about initiative um, that we are, we have been working on for a couple of months. So this is about an HTTP API uh, besides the XML RPC API that we already have in Uni. Uh, why? Uh, we thought there is a need of it because um, we are seeing more and more use uh, of Uni in automated scenarios uh, where it is part of bigger systems and mostly driven by APIs. Uh, now, AP, XML RPC API uh, protocol is uh, pretty easy to pick up, but still it doesn't have as um, good support or tooling support as we have for a, uh, HTTP API. And that was one of the main um, reason that we went to that direction. And uh, now I will ask uh, John uh, to present uh, uh, the community uh, where we are and uh, see uh, uh, how excited community gets about this initiative. <laughs> Thank you. John, you can take Thanks. over. Thanks, Abit. Hi. So yeah, I have a similar voice problem as Julio, so I hope it, my voice is not so annoying. Um, let me quickly share my screen. OK. I think you should be able to see it now. So yes, today I'm going to show you a small uh, you a small demo about how to use uh, the HTTP API in the most basic sense. And um, I should actually start with um, showing where to find some information if you want to try it yourself. So basically, with the HTTP API, we have the same um, structure as the XML RPC API. So all the endpoints are the same. It's just a different inter interface to use the same endpoints. Um, therefore, we don't have a new um, separate documentation for it. But instead, we have in, enhanced the uh, existing API documentation to add some add the re relevant parts for XML um, HTTP API. For example, we have an overview of all the namespaces we have um, in the API here um, with any of them. There are a couple of things added here in, in each methods description. So first up, um, there is this um, HTTP request type information. Um, so basically we support two different um, request verbs, um, that being get and post. And the, the basic distinction we 
um, designed this with is the um, read-only methods, um, such as the methods that um, look up something or list something that uh, that do not do any change to the system, are um, in general get methods, and the, all the others that manipulate the system in any way are post methods. And with, within the um, documentation with the each method, you can get that information, find that information at the top here. And the second thing is um, using the HTTP API, you need to um, specify the parameter names for each parameter you pass. So we made sure that every method has their parameters well-defined um, with their parameter names and types. And yeah, as, as obvious from the title, um, we use JSON to um, transfer data with um, HTTP requests. Um, apart from here, uh, we have also added a couple of sample scripts that use HTTP API in the end of this page, sample scripts page. So this, these are the most basic examples using curl um, that shows you how to um, create a session, do a login, and use um, different endpoints, um, some get endpoints and post endpoints. So today, basically, I'm going to sh uh, show you how to do each of these requests. Um, start it. Yeah, I think the font is big enough. So let's, um, OK. So my. API endpoint um, will be my own uni 2022.5 instance. And this path is the root path to all the API requests. And I want to set up some aliases for convenience here. So yeah, I will use curl here because it's obviously the most basic form that I could show this to you, but the, this could be adaptable for any kind of um, client you have. Um, and in fact, in in the um, upcoming version 06, you will have even more um, script examples for different um, languages, especially Python. But in um, the documentation for 05, we have only curl um, examples yet. So need to set some headers for each request. And I need to use um, cookies because my session information, my authentication token will be sent and um, kept via cookies. So I will use this file, save those. And I don't want this progress bar. And I need another Elias to pretty print the um, result JSON data. For that, I'm going to use this module from Python. Okay, so let's um, start with um, looking at the documentation. Um, I'm going to demonstrate a couple of methods in the content management namespace today. So first, let's start with list projects. So I can see that um, the, as a parameter, this only accepts the session key. So um, the session key parameter is common to almost every method in the XMLRPC API, but the session key is native to XMLRPC calls. So when using these methods with HTTP, um, you could omit this parameter because this will be sent, the, the session information will be sent via a cookie instead. So that means for HTTP, um, this method accepts no parameter. And it's obviously a GET request. So um, let's go ahead and try calling it. Projects. And for this request, I want to see the response headers as well because Oops, sorry. What's wrong? Okay, so as you can see, um, we got a 401. That's because we haven't logged in yet. Um, so the first thing we need to do is obviously to log in. So instead of this one, let's do a login request. And login endpoint is a post endpoint. 
And the data is in JSON form that accepts one login parameter and a password. And the endpoint is auth namespace login method and pipe it. So I get success equals true. And with that, since I'm using this cookies file, um, it saved the co cookies return from this request. And this is the cookie that we, sh we um, keep the session information. So with each subsequent request, you, you need to pass this along um, to identify your session. Um, the credentials here that I've used are the same credentials that are used in the web UI login. So you don't need a additional credential for this one. So now uh, that I logged, I'm logged in, I can try this again. And I don't need the headers now. Let's see the result. Okay, so I get a success true and the result is an empty list because I ha don't have any projects defined yet. So let's go ahead and create the create a project and let's check the create project um, endpoint here. So as we can see, uh, apart from the session key, this expects three other parameters, one for project label, name and description. So um, this is going to be a post request to So with the um, post endpoints, um, there are two ways to pass, um, send some data along with the request actually. So you could either use the query string for um, some basic stuff, simpler parameters, for example, or if you want to do it in a more structured way, you can use, um, you can send the, the data in the body as a JSON object. So first I'm going to show it with um, the query query parameters. So let's do it like this. Um, project label equals my project. Name equals my space project. Description will be empty. And I'm going to pipe the output. So um, in the result, you can see the newly created project and the details of it. Um, well, as you can see, I use the query string here, but it could get too complicated too quickly. For example, I have I had to es escape the special characters manually here. And if you have anything longer than this, that could be hard to type. So as a, as a second um, choice, we can do this via um, the request body. So let me actually delete this project first. Move projects and that needs project label parameter. Okay, now it's deleted. So I'm gonna add it again, but this time I will use, a, use JSON in the body. And for that, I have a, uh, I've pre prepared for, um, sorry, wait. I need to go into structure actually. Okay. I have a um, JSON file here. So uh, with my values preset. So I'm gonna just send over the data in this file directly with curl and post request and the data will be from this file. What did I do wrong? Am I writing it correctly? Let's see. Ah, wait, okay. I think I have a problem here. This has to be project label, not label. 
So now I can see um, it was successful and also the information about the newly created project is here. So um, let's go ahead and do a couple of other calls. Um, for example, you can update um, an existing project um, using the update project endpoint. And here you can see it's a little bit more complicated. Oh no, so here. So it can get a little bit more complicated with um, with a nested structure like this. Obviously the JSON body is, is a better choice. So I have uh, another JSON data here for updating. And this one will update only the description of the existing project. So let's try this one. Actually, um, so this JSON data contains only the description, but um, I need also the project label here. So another way to, the third way actually, is to use um, both the query string and the JSON data actually, that's also possible. So the description um, is in the this JSON file, but I can still um, send the project label in the query string like this. And yes, as you can see, now the description has been updated uh, with this value. Um, okay, maybe another example could be an environment, for example, how to attach, um, create an environment in the project. I think I also have one for this. Okay, so these are the um, data I need to call this create environment endpoint. I think I have also some parameter mismatch here. Label and okay, now, yeah, these um, example data are from a really earlier version of the API, so some parameter names has been changed since. This doesn't work. Check again. I wonder if this could be like this. Yes. So I attached an environment here um, to the project. And um, finally, in a, in a typical content management scenario, um, you would also need to attach some sources. So for that, first, um, we should check um, what channels do we have. And for that, I'm going to call a different namespace. Um, the channel namespace and list software channels from that namespace. And yeah, as I can see, I have a channel called test channel here. It's not a real channel, but doesn't matter for this um, demo. So then uh, when I look at, after I look at the find the channel label from here, I can use it in the um, attach source endpoint. So there are two overloads of this method. Um, if we check the parameter list, one of them allows you to put the source in a specific position, but we're not interested with that now because this will be the only channel that we have. So we're gonna use this one. Um, okay. So I need to do a post request and I'm gonna use the query string parameters now. And what I need is project label. And I need source type as software. And the source label will be 
this label. So I can see now is the, in the result that the um, source has been attached. Um, so finally, what we might want to do is to actually build the project. So since we have an environment and a source, which is the bare minimum to be able to build a project, we can now just go ahead and build it um, using the uh, build project endpoint. For this also, we have two overloads. Um, so one is the optional message here um, for, for logging purposes, but I don't think we need it as well. So let's just use this one. That means I need, I just need the project label parameter for this endpoint. So another post request. And project label will be my project. So, okay, that means this means that the build process has started, and I can actually check the actual status by pulling the list project environments with the project label. And in the status, I can see that it's in the generating repo data stage. And actually, I can also um, call lookup project and with the label. So. Yeah, this has all the information about the, all the basic information about the project. And now I can see here, the last build date is just now. So that means my build is successful. Let's check again with, from the environment. Yeah, now when I check the environment again, it says it's built. So it's ready, ready to be consumed. And yeah, this I think this covers um, everything about the HTTP API. Like I said, um, functionality-wise, there's nothing new. It's, the, it's the, all the same endpoints that we offer with uh, via XMLRPC already, but it's a whole different interface. And for some ad hoc usage, it's, it's quite easier um, to, to use. And also for automated tasks, um, it's, it could be easily adapted via, I don't know, some Python scripts or JavaScript or anything else. So um, I guess that was it I wanted to show you. Now I guess we can take some questions. Uh, actually, I would like to, to ask some questions about it. Um, uh, first, it's a great feature. Yeah, so so I really like that. Um, from from a technical point of view, as far as I understand it, it all builds on top of the XML RPC API. So if an endpoint is available there, it will also be available with JSON. Or is there anything that need to be done before an endpoint is available? Uh, no, actually, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's the same system. It's the same logic behind. Just two different interfaces plugging into the same. Um, API core, I would say. Um, there are a couple of exceptions for that, um, but these are like mostly some maintenance methods or something that really doesn't apply to either one of the frameworks, like um, something related to authentication process or something. But all the um, all the methods that a user needs um, is available equally in both frameworks. Okay, great. So, and and um, if I would touch an XML RPC endpoint or create a new one. Do you have to do anything from a development perspective to also support JSON or is it just out of the box then? So yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, it's mostly the same, but there are just a couple of things that needs attention. Um, actually, I can um, show some examples. Um, okay, let's go to the content management handler to see the 
already see the same stuff that I already showed. Yeah, there are a couple of things that needs attention. Um, first of all, we have we have a bunch of a couple of annotations here. For example, the read-only annotation. This um, is important because before um, the introduction of the HTTP API, the XMLRPC interface looked um, looked at the method names and tried to find prefixes like list, get, lookup, and such, and automatically decided those are um, read-only endpoints. So we don't have this anymore. Uh, instead, we have to mark each uh, read-only method with this annotation so that both XMLRPC and HTTP API treats this as a read-only method. What this means for XMLRPC is simply they will be accessible by read-only API users. And for HTTP API, additionally, um, it will be a GET request instead of a POST request. But in the end, um, as developers, we should um, be careful on what we want to mark these with. So if there are any any changes in the system at all, so it must be a um, must not be a read-only method. Apart from this, we also have API ignore annotation, which is also new. So this could be used like this to um, exclude any public method inside a handler from the AP, from both APIs. This could be kind of some maintenance methods or some help helper methods that you don't want to include in the API catalog, then you would use this annotation. And also, if you want to selectively ignore some of the endpoints, for example, let's say this lookup project doesn't make sense for XMLRPC API, then you can add a parameter here, um, API type dot XMLRPC. If you do it like this, it means this endpoint will be ignored by XMLRPC. So this will be only available for the HTTP. And, or you can just do the other way, and this will mean it will be ignored by HTTP and only will be available in the XMLRPC. So these are the most significant changes um, regarding code. But other than this, we also have some new um, restrictions or new guides um, in the wiki. So here in the code base various section, uh, we have a new um, page called writing documentation for the API. This was actually long needed because we didn't have any documentation on how to write those API documentations. So this is obviously done by development, um, but we always had to take an existing one as an example and do some guesswork on top of it. But now with this, um, this document, it's a quite long document. It describes every um, Javadoc tags and all, all these macros that we use in all the documentation and their proper usage. And additional to this guide, there ha has been actually some differences, some changes in these macros. So they work a little bit different now um, because of the new requirement that we must have a parameter name for each parameter definition. So some of these uh, macros have the name parameter in as new. So um, from now on, whoever is um, developing some new endpoint or doing some changes to anything, it's encouraged to read through this document and um, use these all these macros correctly. And yeah, this is the changes in the documentation part of things. Okay, cool, perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, and and also the documentation is very helpful because yeah, I already struggled about that to to finding the, the right way to to document a new endpoint. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the qu question, Dominic. So now. Uh six months from now or a year from now, we will highlight a successful use case and implementation of this, right? We hope so. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, maybe one additional question, Ken. Um, so so for space command, we, we still stick to, to um, consuming the XML RPC as we do all the time. Or yes, should that's we correct. then start using JSON? Okay. I mean, I don't know. We we haven't thought about um, implementing um, the HTTP there, but I'm not sure. I mean, how better would it be? Okay, so the data type would would be JSON, which is a good thing, but I haven't 
heard about any requests on that yet. I think it's fine to to stick to the DXML RPC to to be honest. I was just curious um, if there's anything I have to take care about it. But yeah, okay. Okay. Any other questions? Then I guess I will hand back over to Abit now. So thanks for your time. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Thank you for a very good session. So yeah, time for a general question about Shuni, if you have any about plans or any you know, question about an existing feature or anything. Yeah, so so maybe one thing. Um, I, I don't know if you guys are aware because obviously it, it doesn't impact that much user still a lot um it looks like that that there are some issues with the um, usage of http proxy since quite a while um when you sync repository data um there were a lot of github issues um i also provided some help and, and workarounds here and the the pull request okay to be honest it's a little hacky i have to admit that yeah but it would actually work but it's still an ongoing thing and um so so we have to manually apply patches every time a unit get released um any idea what we what we can do or even i can do to to further support it so that we can bring it to maybe 06 or something because that's really a pain when you need to use an http proxy to to get to the internet and, and sync your repositories um okay i'm not aware of uh, this pr dominic uh, but i will take a look and um yeah at this moment uh, i i cannot add much on the top of this one because i don't have all the whole background of the problem but we can definitely reach out on that um, pr yeah i i have some information on this one yeah actually uh, so this one we have a car for this uh, in our board Alex was already um, having some reviews uh, on that pull request, and I think, yeah, uh, we will try to, to now that you are also mentioning this uh, thing here, Dominic, we will try to to bring some more attention to that to, to finally, uh, yeah, see if we get this patch in at least temporarily, if we get a better solution, or how we are proceeding to not get this pull request pending yeah, for so long. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, by the way. <laughs> no problem. I, I was just curious because now when you have to do it all the time and, and it's uh, also you see that with each update, other user create GitHub issues then. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's really appreciate if we maybe can um, do some work around for now and, and work on a proper solution in future. Um, I think it was mentioned that that um, the idea is to get rid of ul grabber in total mm -hmm. and place it with mm -hmm. something else yeah exactly yeah but but yeah that would come probably later and we will need to as you mentioned solve the situation in a way to prevent to to you know to avoid the people to have this annoying problem one and the next time on every update yeah exactly. okay thank you thank you thank you pablo thank you dominic any other question One, two, three. Okay, doesn't seem to break. I, I just wanted to uh, give a little update. Um, I'm going to be <clears throat> presenting at the Open Source Summit in Austin, Texas next month. And uh, part of my presentation will be on Uyuni. Um, generally speaking, when we uh, talk to our friends in the open source community, there is a lot of positive responses about Uyuni because most people uh, aren't familiar with tools that can manage multiple different Linux distributions. So that part is is really important. So, you know, if you if you're in the Austin, Texas area, or if you'd like to see the presentation afterward, I can I can share it with the community. 
uh, yeah, and speaking about new distributions, or in this case, <clears throat> new person, versions of some distributions, I know that the community wants to know when we are going to add the, the Ubuntu 20. Um, four. Yeah. Exactly, support. Uh, yeah, well, the small announcement is that that is on my list of things for the next SUSE Hack Week that is going to happen soon in in July, if I'm not wrong, or was it June? I don't remember anymore. June, June, in June. Ah, yeah, June. Okay. And uh, the our Ion Squad, Soul developers are, are already working on the Salt bundle. Of course, if anyone from the community wants to jump and provide some help before that, for example, testing the testing and creating the bootstrap repositories or adding the spacewalk, uh, the, the channels, the spacewalk common channels, then yeah, go ahead. Otherwise I expect we should have this, it's not a promise, but I expect we will have the support on Uni 2022-07. Cool. Thank you, Don and Julio. Okay, I will ask one more time. Any further question? Um, Stefan here, just uh, talking about releases. Uh, I heard Red Hat 9 is released, uh, probably going into your direction, Julio. Any chance or uh, plans to also enable uh, probably the Alma 9 version for me on uh, on OBS? Or do you see any objections at the moment on that? No, Once no it's problem. Available, obviously. No problem about that. Just remember that requesting new operating systems, systems at OBS, that is a request for the Open Build Service administrators, but I guess you also yep. want to know if there is a problem. Well, we will need, of course, to enable the client tools as well, but for the server and the proxy, as soon as they add the uh, Alma Linux 9 to OBS, you can just Right, send me a message on, on Gitter or an email to the list, and I can adjust the meta configuration for you for systems management, Unimaster, and all that, and other L, etc. etc. Oh, cool. Thanks. Um, do you have any thought on that one, whether then to keep uh, the Alma Linux 8 version on that one, or like run 8 and 9 or so? Or um... doesn't it matter? <clears throat> I guess you should have a look and see how complicated it would be to get this into uh, Alma Linux 9. To be honest, I still didn't have a look to see what the differences are, so I don't even know how complicated this would be to add to be added as as client. Not to mention server and proxy. So hard to say at this at this moment. I would say. Okay. But at the moment, you don't see an issue with running, let's say, two distributions there, Nobius. I'm not going to try um, to nail you down on that. <laughs> ah, well, of course, no. Well, of course, if you want to enable both for systems management to Uni Master and Master Other and Master yeah. Other EL, then no, no big deal. That's something we can do. Uh, uh, we don't have that many packages that I think to get complaints from the Open Build Service people, I guess, and that should allow you to compare how difficult is running it on top of nine versus eight. Yeah, not a problem. Yeah, just get talk to the admins if the Alma Linux nine repository yeah, once is it's there. Um, yeah, great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anything else? Any further question? Okay, if that's not the case, then yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, I wish you all a wonderful weekend ahead. Uh, take care and see you next time. Bye. All right. See you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. See you. Bye bye.